a submariner in the Second World War wasn't an easy job. It was dark, cramped, and death could be at any moment, even at the hands of your own torpedoes. Torpedoes were the main weapon of World War II submarines, but they were also plagued with a number of problems, like premature detonation and depth gauge issues. Another issue these torpedoes had was the very minor, slight tendency to circle back on the firing submarine and sink it. No, no big deal. After the First World War, engineers designed torpedoes to be able to correct their course towards a target. This was done using a mechanically set gyro angle, which was set before the torpedo was launched while still in the submarine. After the torpedo was fired, it would travel straight for a given distance until the gyro steering mechanism would begin helping correct the course to turn the warhead. After it turned the given angle, the torpedo would straighten back out and hopefully hit its target. But here's the thing. Some of the torpedo's gyro mechanisms failed during that turning process, and the torpedoes themselves would never stop turning. This would cause the torpedo to run in circles, which obviously would cause some precarious situations for the attacking submarine. There are 30 documented cases of this happening during the war. Luckily, only two were fatal. One of those fatal circular run mishaps was that of the USS Tula B on July 29, 1944. The submarine was on her fourth war patrol in the Palau Islands when she registered an enemy convoy on her radar. The crew fired two torpedoes and two minutes later was rocked by a violent explosion. There was a lone survivor of the 60-man crew, gunner's mate C.W. Koikdendal, who was thrown from the bridge into the water and later picked up as a prisoner of war by a Japanese destroyer. He luckily survived the war and was released on VJ Day. Other than the USS Tula B, there was another, perhaps more notable sinking. It was that of the USS Tang. The Tang was the most successful of all American submarines deployed during the war, sinking 33 vessels in her short time. On her fifth war patrol, just one year after she was launched, the USS Tang encountered a very large enemy convoy. It was the night of October 23, 1944 and the Tang began firing torpedoes at the ship convoy it encountered, slowly amassing enemy casualties. Every ship in that convoy encountered that night was burning or sunk after the Tang attacked. Surviving that attack, on the next night of October 24th, the Tang encountered another Japanese convoy carrying planes. The USS Tang unleashed a number of torpedoes at the transports and started making its getaway as two escort ships began chasing her. She was able to sink all of the vessels in the convoy, other than one transport that was dead in the water. The crew of the Tang maneuvered the ship to finish the job, having only two of her 24 total torpedoes left to fire. The crew fired both of its remaining torpedoes, the first running dead straight, but the last curving sharply to the left, circling around until it hit the Tang on the stern. The explosion rocked the vessel, and its aft end bottomed out on the seafloor at 180 feet of depth. The crew that had survived the explosion crowded into the torpedo room at the front hoping to get out of the forward escape hatch. The patrol boat they were chasing started to drop depth charges which only worsened the damage to the ship. Thirteen men were able to escape out of the forward hatch, and four others escaped from the bridge. Of the thirteen that got out of the forward hatch, Eight reached the surface, and only five were eventually rescued, but those four that escaped from the bridge also survived. In total, 78 men lost their lives in the accident, and nine survived. In the final fateful patrol of the USS Tang, 24 torpedoes were fired. 22 found their mark on enemy ships. 13 of those ships were sunk. One of the 24 torpedoes missed, and the final sank the Tang. And that's the story of two unfortunate submarine accidents during World War II that ended up sinking themselves thanks to malfunctioning torpedoes.
Known now as the Goldsboro Incident, in the middle of the night on the 23rd of January 1961, a B-52 Stratofortress was flying over the skies of the Atlantic near the U.S. coast. The plane developed a fuel leak and was directed to fly towards Goldsboro, North Carolina, to land at nearby Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. However, as they had just crossed over land from the sea, the pilots lost control of the plane and had to bail out of the craft. Only five crew members successfully parachuted out. The rest died in the crash. This wasn't an ordinary flight for the B-52 and the crew, though. Nor would it be an ordinary crash. On board the plane were two 3.8 megaton thermonuclear bombs. After the crew lost control of the plane and it began falling to the earth, it broke up and the two bombs separated from their attachments in the bays. They fell to the ground over North Carolina. At this point, you're probably thinking about that massive irradiated zone in North Carolina that no one's allowed to go to because those nuclear bombs exploded back in the day. Except that that doesn't exist, as you can probably guess, the bombs never detonated. The morning after the crash, investigators found that one of the bombs had successfully deployed its parachute and the other had fallen into a group of trees. The one that fell into the trees fell at such a high rate of speed, it was 18 feet under the surface of the earth when the crews found it. Luckily for everyone in North Carolina, the core of the weapons remained intact and there was no radiation leaking. The military at the time made sure to keep the public calm, but records now indicate that experts were rather concerned that one of the bombs would end up detonating due to accidental arming during the crash. This little tidbit of how close North Carolina came to being nuked wasn't really known until 2013 when author Eric Slosser acquired documents under the FIA, or the Freedom of Information Act. The documents detailed an alarming fact, that five out of the six total safety mechanisms the bomb had on board had become disarmed during the fall and crash. If the last one had unlocked, the bomb likely would have exploded. It was one 1960s-era dynamo low-voltage switch that kept the bomb from detonating. To give some perspective on how bad this would have been, the bombs that fell in Greensboro were 250 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The fireball from the bomb would have been 2 kilometers in diameter, and third-degree burns would have registered on human skin up to 19 kilometers away, not to mention the massive amount of radiation that would have leaked across the U.S. All of this said, there's some dispute to the claim that the bomb almost detonated by other researchers, believing that there were a few other safety mechanisms in place that would have kept the bomb from exploding. A debate can be had about the actual probability, but regardless, two nukes fell from the sky and dropped on North Carolina in 1961. The bomb that landed without a parachute actually broke up into several pieces, with one piece containing a significant amount of enriched uranium, which was never found. Between 1950 and 1968, the Goldsboro incident really wasn't that unique. There were 700 documented similarly significant nuclear accidents in that nearly 20-year span, with many arguably coming closer to detonation than Goldsboro. While now, in hindsight, we can recognize that the U.S. never accidentally nuked itself, it should be noted how many times the United States did come close to detonating thermonuclear weapons on their own citizens. On August 4th, 1972, the calm waters off the port of Haiphong during the height of the Vietnam War suddenly erupted. The sea was exploding. At the source of the explosions were a series of magnetic sea mines that were designed to go off when changing magnetic fields from passing ships set off their detectors. But there were no ships passing by. The sea was clear. The mines were planted by the United States Navy as a defense of the coast, but why did they all suddenly explode on this otherwise calm day? Was it a covert operation? Perhaps a secret submarine. 
The military at the time suspected none of that. They suspected it was the sun. This sun theory was actually confirmed as information about the incident was recently declassified, allowing researchers to look back at that time and study it. It's believed that a massive solar storm at the time caused coronal mass ejections, which interfere with electrical and electronic devices here on Earth. These ejections are known to cause electrical blackouts and down GPS systems, among other interferences. The solar storm that occurred in 1972 is believed to have been one of the strongest ever recorded in human history. The charged particles from the solar storm hit the Earth that day just 14.6 hours after they left the sun, something that in other solar storms might take days. The particles slammed into the atmosphere and produced significant electrical disturbance. In the South China Sea, roughly 30 naval mines had spontaneously detonated. The sun caused the sea to explode. Militarized aviation has been around since the beginning of human flight, and over that time there have been many aviation accidents. While military planes of past were more accident-prone than the technological and mechanical powerhouses that are modern fighter jets, accidents do still happen. Accidents like fighter jets shooting themselves down. One of the first historically significant incidents of a plane shooting itself down was back in 1956. On the 21st of September, a U.S. Navy pilot named Thomas W. Attridge was flying a Grumman F-11 just offshore of Long Island, New York. He had been flying for roughly 20 miles and climbed to 20,000 feet to test fire the plane's 20 millimeter cannons. He began a dive in preparation for the test and fired the cannons at 13,000 feet after leveling off, letting off roughly 70 rounds over four seconds. Immediately after firing, he began an even steeper dive, engaging the afterburner. Once he reached 7,000 feet, he fired his cannons again, fully emptying his gun belts. After finishing off his rounds, the windshield of his aircraft immediately shattered due to an unidentified object. Attridge assumed a bird strike, but after getting his bearings and beginning to fly back to his airbase in Calverton, New York, he noticed that his right engine's intake lip had been sizably gashed. He fought the engine, but noticed he couldn't get more than 78% power to it. Pushing the throttle further caused the engine to rattle and make noise like a vacuum cleaning up heavy dirt. The tiger suddenly dropped, slicing through a forest, hurtling 300 feet before coming to rest steadily. Surprisingly, Attridge survived the crash, but he broke his leg and three vertebrae on impact, and the plane was in a blaze. Attridge struggled with his gear and was able to free himself from the plane, and a rescue helicopter picked him up for treatment. One thing was still a mystery, though. Why or how did this happen? An investigation into the incident revealed that the cockpit of the F-11 was not hit by a bird, but rather the rounds Attridge fired in his first burst. Because Attridge accelerated into a steep dive after firing, he unknowingly overtook his own bullets in the air, which had slowed significantly due to drag. Attridge was flying under the bullets when he leveled off and fired his second burst of rounds. After leveling off, Attridge eventually crossed paths with the trajectory of his first bullet's path. One round crashed through the windshield, another hit his engine intake, and a third bullet punctured the nose of the craft. The bullet that struck the engine became lodged inside, rattling around breaking components the more Attridge flew and the harder he pushed his engine. Attridge eventually made a full recovery after shooting down his own plane and even returned to military aviation. So that's the story of the time a U.S. Navy fighter pilot shot his own plane down, crashed, and survived. Near the end of the Cold War, the United States military grew concerned about its equipment's capabilities to withstand the effects of an electromagnetic pulse. Out in the middle of a giant pit in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the government built a giant wooden structure named Atlas I. 
standing for Air Force Weapons Lab Transmission Line Aircraft Simulator. This massive, ominous structure was built between 1972 and 1980 to validate the United States' security against an EMP attack. Electromagnetic pulses, or EMPs, are intense bursts of electromagnetic energy often resultant of an aerial nuclear explosion. Militaries of past, and some still present, considered using these weapons to inflict damage upon electrical and electronic systems of opposing countries. EMPs do that through the high current and voltage surges created through the initial blast that burn out all sensitive components in electronics nearby. Back in the 1980s, this this would have been bad news for the US or any country for that matter. But in 2019, this would practically bring the modern world to a standstill. Communication would be nearly impossible. Cars and planes wouldn't work, phones wouldn't work, nothing about our modern life would work properly. It's this fear that the US ultimately capitulated to. It's this fear that the U.S. ultimately capitulated to near the end of the Cold War, causing them to build the Atlas I testing center, also known as the Trestle. This center was specifically designed for testing electronic machines against EMP blasts. But to understand a little bit more about why this center was built, we need to step a little further back into the heat of the Cold War. EMPs have been a known and understood weapon since early nuclear tests in the 1940s. In 1945, when the US was getting ready for their series of Trinity nuclear tests, physicists advised the Army to take precautions to protect their electronic equipment. Even still, many recordings of those tests were fried from the blast. 1962 marked the most prominent EMP test for the US where they conducted a high-altitude nuclear test. Named Starship Prime, this test involved the detonation of a bomb weighing 1.44 megatons over the Pacific Ocean at about 400 kilometers up in the sky. The resultant EMP blast knocked out streetlights over 1,400 kilometers away and set off alarms and damaged other electronics. In the following days to months, several low-Earth satellites actually failed due to radiation damage. It was after these unplanned effects from the EMP were seen that the US government and military became acutely aware of just how damaging an EMP blast could be. Over in the Soviet Union, EMP tests were also being conducted. After all, it was the heat of the Cold War. In 1962, the same year as the US's famous Starship Prime test, the Soviets detonated a 300 kiloton bomb, roughly four times as small as the US's bomb over Kazakhstan. The Soviets set up a 570 kilometer long telephone line fitted with sensors and over voltage protectors on a regular interval. The EMP blast caused every single sensor to trip. It also set an electrical power plant on fire many miles away thanks to induction that occurred in a 1,000 kilometer long buried transmission cable. While the Soviet's bomb was much smaller than the Starship Prime test, it caused much more damage due to its positioning over land. Both the US and the Soviet Union grew increasingly fearful of EMP attacks from the other as they were more aware than ever of just what they could do. An EMP could knock out an entire Navy fleet, it could disable an airbase, it could cause an immeasurable amount of damage to the opponent. The US Army became obsessed with hardening all of their military hardware making sure that it could withstand EMP blasts. They built 18 different test facilities at Air Force bases all over the US. Each testing center focused on the same principles. Aircraft were parked on the ground and a short burst of electromagnetic radiation was blasted right at it. After that, engineers studied the aftermath. The problem was that this EMP generated from high energy transmission reflected off the ground under the aircraft, causing the vehicles to be exposed to two times the amount of radiation they would absorb by flying. This is where the Atlas I testing center comes back into play. 
Atlas I was specifically designed to mitigate this radiation reflection from the ground. Engineers built a giant wooden platform over a bowl-shaped indention in the desert floor. This platform made up the bulk of the Atlas I test structure and was made of laminated wood in fiberglass so that it didn't interfere with the electromagnetic pulses. Measuring 200 feet by 200 feet, it also had a 400-foot-long towpath and came in at a height of 12 stories. All of this careful design and placement meant that it could simulate an EMP blast on an airplane while stopping any radiation reflection from the ground. It was the perfect test site for military aircraft. Planes would be towed onto the entirely wooden and fiberglass platform in place to wait for an EMP blast. A pair of Max 5 megavolt generators, one mounted on each side, were used to produce a short-range EMP burst. When combined, they could produce a 200 gigawatt pulse of electromagnetic energy. At short range, this was equivalent to the pulse from a thermonuclear explosion. Over the Atlas I's operational years from 1980 to 1991, the Tressel was used to test massive bombers, fighters, and even missiles against EMP attacks. In 1991, at the end of the Cold War, the Atlas I test site was finally shut down, but the structure still stands as a national monument that can be seen today. We often think of nuclear bombs as extreme weapons of destruction. While they're certainly that, in the 1960s, the world's superpowers began investigating more practical uses for these powerful devices. The US and Soviet Union were embattled in the heat of the Cold War in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Both countries had stockpiled nuclear weapons, but thousands of them simply sat idly across their respective country. The US subsequently created Operation Plowshare and the Soviet Union, a program called Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy. Operation Plowshare in the U.S. was formed to explore the possibility of using nuclear explosions for excavation or natural gas fracturing. The evidence of this project's tests can still be seen through craters in the Nevada desert. Surprisingly, this research project persisted for nearly 20 years, from 1958 to 1975. The Soviets were also researching practical uses for nuclear explosions, and like the U.S., their research was focused on natural gas and mining. Unlike the U.S., however, little concern was given to the environmental impact of these Soviet nuclear tests. Soviet engineers behind the project once contaminated a densely populated region along the River Volga. They also decided to blow up a river to create a reservoir, which they succeeded in doing, except it's still radioactive to this day. During this nuclear research, scientists realized that they might be able to solve a problem that had been raging for years. In 1963, a gas well in southern Uzbekistan suffered a blowout at a depth of 2.4 kilometers. The natural gas caught ablaze and for the next three years, it burned steadily. This unquenchable fire was causing the loss of more than 12 million cubic meters of gas each day. That's enough to supply the needs of many major cities and roughly the equivalent volume of 12 Empire State Buildings. No one in the country knew how to put the fires out, and all previous attempts had failed. It was at this point of desperation that dropping a nuclear bomb on the fires seemed like a pretty great idea to engineers and officials. Physicists calculated that if a nuclear bomb was detonated close to the blowout region, the resulting pressure could shut any hole within 50 meters. Researchers ultimately calculated that the bomb needed to be 30 kilotons, or double the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. After confirming the calculations, officials decided that a nuclear explosion was the best way to stop the raging fire. In 1966, two wells were drilled sloping towards the blowout region determined to be at a depth of 1.4 kilometers needed to seal the holes. The 30 kiloton bomb was lowered into the most promising well, and then the well itself was backfilled with cement. Then, they detonated the bomb. There's no better way to understand what that day was like other than this account from the Soviet newspaper Pravda Vostika of Tashkent. On that cold autumn day in 1966, an underground tremor of unprecedented force shook the ground with a sparse grass cover on white sand. A dusty haze rose over the desert. The orange-colored torch of the blazing wells diminished, first slowly, then more rapidly, until it flickered and finally died out. For the first time in 1,064 days, 
quiet descended on the area. The jet-like roar of the gas well had finally been silenced. In 20 seconds, a three-year-long fire had been extinguished using a nuclear explosion, much to the satisfaction of Soviet engineers. The test was a success, but soon engineers were presented with another case to test their experiment again. A few months later, a fire broke out at the Pamik gas field, and the fire spread to the surface through various holes. Engineers and physicists determined that in order to stop this fire, they would need a stronger 47 kiloton bomb lowered to a deeper depth of 2.4 kilometers. The bomb was lowered into its well, backfilled with cement like before, and detonated. After a few days, the fire had stopped. It was after this second successful attempt at putting out large gas fires that the Soviets had found what they considered a highly practical use for nuclear explosions. They used nuclear bombs to stop a fire in May 1972 in the city of Mary and Asia. In July of that same year, they also used a nuclear explosion to stop a leaking well in Ukraine. The last known about attempt of this practice was in 1981 on a well on the northwestern coast of Russia. Of all of the explosions, the second at the Pamir gas field was the deepest and most powerful. And that's the story of how excess nuclear weapons, curious Soviet engineers, and rampant natural gas fires led to the underground detonation of massive nuclear bombs during the Cold War.